Happy New Year and a blessed PLN Day to you all. We have some exciting announcements here at PLN. This year, we are working on expanding into a positive leftist news network, adding more comrades to our writing and development team, and you will soon see some new hosts on the show as well, so don't be too surprised if you see some new faces on the cover. We are also adding a stretch goal to our Patreon, and we are hoping to expand enough and get enough people working on the project collectively to hopefully one day put out bi-monthly content, something that I know a lot of you have been asking for, but that just hasn't been possible so far due to everyone's workload, mostly my workload. So good news here and good news around the globe as comrades have, as usual, been pushing the struggle forward. So cheers, my friends. Let's make 2022 a year that the ruling classes will not forget. Italy is at it again with another general strike this month, as Senza Tregua put it, lighting the fire of the class struggle. On December 16th, workers from all sectors except healthcare, schools, and environmental service, who voluntarily abstained due to pandemic circumstances, took part in a day-long strike opposing a budget law that consists of yet again another attack on the rights of the working class by the Draghi government. The law would modify income tax brackets to protect the highest earners, it sought to raise their retirement age, and sought to abolish a tax that funded public health. The transport sector shutdown caused huge disruptions, as did most trades and services, including gig economy workers, and demonstrations were held across several major cities. The strike was less confrontational than previous worker-led actions in Italy this year, as organizers were more amenable to dialogue with Draghi and wanted the action to be constructive, as they put it. This drew some criticism, but it's incredible to see Italian workers continuously showing up and standing strong together against all attempts to undermine them. Solidarietà. Starbucks workers have successfully unionized the first locations in America. Despite a fierce union-busting campaign by the company, the workers won a majority of votes to unionize across three stores in Buffalo. The company now has to negotiate a contract, and they fear that a strong one will lead to more unionization efforts across the country, and possibly the world. Their fears are justified, because in the coming months, Three more locations in Buffalo and one in Meza, Arizona are also set to hold union elections. Let the ruling classes tremble. Workers have nothing to lose but their chains and a world to win. On December 1st, 50,000 university and college union members at 58 universities across the UK went on strike for three consecutive days after universities and their representatives refused to withdraw pension cuts, address worsening working conditions, job insecurity, pay gaps, and plummeting wages. UCU General Secretary Joe Grady stated the truth is that staff are asking for the bare minimum in a sector awash with money. But sadly, the only time vice chancellors seem to listen is when staff take action. And those leading our universities should not underestimate their determination to change this sector for the better. Research by the National Union of Students shows 73% of students support university staff taking strike action. Solidarity with UCU members pushing steadfast for change. The indie game developer Vaudio Games has unionized, becoming the first of its kind to do so in North America. Company management recognizes the union, which even includes contract workers who make up more than half of the 13-person dev team. Workers were inspired by the successful union drives of the game writers at Voltage and Paizo. Vaudio Games workers will soon begin contract negotiations with their employer to both improve their workplace and make permanent the benefits they already enjoy, such as a four-day work week. Game workers are long overdue for massive unionization. Horror stories about brutal working conditions, infamous crunch periods, and widespread sexual abuse have rocked the industry over the past few years. Stephanie Sterling has done an amazing job at bringing these industry abuses to light. Commander Sterling, we thank you for your service to the people, and we at PLN hope that this marks the start of a massive wave of unionization in the industry. After a week-long strike that threatened the country's power supply, coal miners in Bosnia have reached a deal with the state-run power company. Thousands of coal miners have won increased pay and better working conditions. The Bosnian people showed their solidarity with the strikers with warm drinks, blankets, food, and even a concert as they demonstrated in the capital of Sarajevo. 
They also sang an impromptu song together telling Fadil Novalich, the leading neoliberal politician, to go fuck himself. Their victory gives hope to all workers in the country as striking and this level of solidarity with strikers is rare. Of course, coal is not the way of the future and it must be phased out as quickly as possible. But the transition to renewable energies must include a just transition for workers where none of them are left behind and their material needs are taken care of. Members of United Auto Workers in the US have overwhelmingly voted to move to a direct democracy voting system for choosing new leadership. One member, one vote. On December 2nd, vote results from the 143,000 return ballots showed that 63.6% .6 of voters support the reform. As one of the country's most significant unions, this represents a historic win that members have been fighting for for decades. As Kellogg's workers went on strike in October, shutting down facilities in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Nebraska, the company announced it would be firing and replacing all 1,400 strikers, but replacement efforts were a disaster for the company. The Kellogg strike drew massive support from across the country, and in an act of incredible solidarity with the workers, the fast-growing subreddit r anti -work organized to flood the company's online job portal website with fake applications. Incredible. Previously, the subreddit mobilized to hack business receipt printers to send out pro-labor messaging. Keep up the great work, comrades. Solidarity forever. And not long after anti-works hijacking, the Kellogg's workers won. Members of the Bakery, Confectionery, Tobacco, and Grain Millers International Union who work at Kellogg's voted to accept the new labor agreement. The agreement includes no permanent two-tier system, a clear path to full employment, a moratorium on plant closings to 2026, an increase in their pension multiplier, maintenance cost of living increases, and no concessions to the employer. At news of the ratification, BCTGM International President Anthony Shelton stated, Our striking members at Kellogg's Ready to Eat cereal production facilities courageously stood their ground and sacrificed so much in order to achieve a fair contract. This agreement makes gains and does not include any concessions. This marks the end of the 77-day strike that drew international attention and an outpouring of support from fellow workers, community members, Redditors, and others. A happy reminder to unionize your workplaces. The union makes us strong. Amsterdam City Council has decided to ban investors buying cheaper properties and renting them out by putting in place a policy whereby investors cannot purchase a property for less than 512,000 euros without living in it for at least four years. At the moment, about 30% of homes in Amsterdam are owned by private investors, and officials report that they are pricing most people out of the market. New Housing Chief Jakob Wedemeyer said the move is an important step forward, but that more needs to be done. We need national government to make it possible to limit rents so that more people can find an affordable home, he said. We absolutely agree. As part of a coalition agreement, the new Chancellor of Germany plans to raise their minimum wage to 12 euros an hour instead of the current 960 euros an hour. Germany's minimum wage is already among the highest in the EU, and this move will increase the income of 5% of Germany's population, almost 2 million people, by 25%. The economist Felix Hufner said this move should boost overall wage growth. New York City has become the first American city to allow safe injection sites where people can use illegal drugs under the supervision of trained professionals and without threat of arrest. The two established sites have already saved the lives of five people. Over the pandemic, overdose deaths have hit historic highs throughout the USA. In New York City, we saw a 40% increase over the previous year. Social isolation has no doubt contributed to this increase, but safe injection sites are proven to benefit communities by lowering infection rates for diseases like HIV and hepatitis C, and by offering addictions counseling. To date, there have been no drug overdoses in safe injection sites worldwide. Hopefully the program will spread like wildfire. Kansas City Council has approved the right to legal counsel for tenants after a concerted campaign from Stand Up KC, the Heartland Center for Jobs and Freedom, and KC Tenants. The program will guarantee a tenant has legal representation regardless of income when a landlord sues for eviction. Kansas City has joined 12 other American cities in implementing tenants' right to counsel. This is a huge win for the city. Housing is a human right. Abolish landlords. Workers who make cakes for Baskin Robbins have been striking for weeks, which has of course been ignored by the mainstream media. The workers are employed by John Denner Desserts, owned by Rich Products, which distributes to a number of retailers. Workers say they are forced to make 13 cakes per minute in 12 to 14 hour days with only three sick days per year. 
They say that the immense workload and lack of time off has caused many to develop arthritis. Meanwhile, Rich Products made $4 billion in profits off of their exploited labor in 2020. The workers, who are mostly immigrant Latinas, are part of the Bakery, Confectionery, Tobacco Workers, and Grain Millers International Union, which also represents the Kellogg's workers. If you were able to support these workers, a link to their strike fund will be in the show notes. Unionized grocery workers at Kroger-owned Fred Meyers and QFC stores in several cities in Oregon, including Portland, have reached a tentative agreement with management after just one day of striking. Workers walked off the job on December 17th, and by the 18th, they had a new agreement that provides significant wage increases and workplace protections, as well as new retirement and healthcare benefits. Fantastic work. Congratulations to the United Food and Commercial Workers. The European Commission has produced what some are calling the most pro-worker reform to come from the EU in years. Under the new legislation, platform workers such as Uber and Deliveroo drivers will now be considered employees and therefore entitled to labor rights that are granted to most European workers. But don't praise our overlords just yet, this reform of course came from years of a loud and growing platform workers movement. According to trade unionists, the legislation is a step in the right direction and includes most of the key demands from the workers' movement, but also contains significant areas for improvement. A federal jury in Virginia has found the key organizers of the 2017 Unite the Right rally liable for more than $25 million in damages to those who suffered injuries while counter-protesting against the fascists. In addition to individuals such as Jason Kessler, the jury held responsible several white supremacist organizations, including the National Socialist Movement, Vanguard America, and League of the South. The plaintiffs sought to recover enough money to bankrupt those most responsible for organizing the rally, and it looks like they've succeeded. Poor Dickie Spencer's life is in shambles, and he has no one to blame but himself. All you fascists bound to lose. Late in November, from the 26th to 28th, Days of Action were held in the International Rise for Rojava campaign. This global campaign is calling for solidarity with the Kurds in northeast Syria and to smash Turkish fascism. Their main goals are the condemnation and boycott of Turkey for their occupation of Efren and their genocidal violence against the Kurdish people. Over the course of these days, demonstrations were held in Syria and as far away as Senegal, France, and Switzerland, all in solidarity with the Democratic Communalist Project in Rojava. On November 30th, Barbados stopped pledging allegiance to Queen Elizabeth II. With Prince Charles in the audience, the country shed a layer of their colonial past, becoming a republic for the first time in history. The six-month Portland Street Response pilot project has been effective at resolving nonviolent 911 calls, according to a Portland State University study. The Portland Street Response is an unarmed first responder team that includes mental health workers, a paramedic, and health workers, helping to steer people towards social services and healthcare instead of the criminal justice system. A report conducted by PSU's Homelessness Research and Action Collaborative stated, based on the findings, we feel very optimistic about the future of Portland Street Response and believe it is well on its way to becoming a citywide solution to responding to 911 and non-emergency calls involving unhoused people and people experiencing mental health crisis. We adore initiatives like this. Defund, disarm, dismantle, and abolish. And for all the racists and centrists who criticized the BLM protests since 2020, new research shows that between 2000 and 2019, street-level protests across 170 major cities were followed by declines in police killings of Black and Latinx individuals. In fact, the empirical analysis indicates that just one protest in a given city would reduce Black fatalities by 11% and Latinx fatalities by 7% in the following year. So keep standing up and pushing back against the armed protectors of private property and reminding everyone that cops and clan go hand in hand. After years in the making, Chile has finally legalized same-sex marriage in a landslide vote. The new marriage equality legislation recognizes parental ties, full spousal benefits, and adoption rights for married same-sex couples. It will also use gender-neutral terms such as spouse and parent in the country's civil code. Pedro Araya, a recently re-elected senator, stated this is a historic day. In a huge step forward for LGBTQ rights in Japan, Tokyo's municipal government has moved to legally recognize same-sex partnerships. While it does not grant all of the privileges of hetero marriages, the partnership system allows same-sex couples to rent places to live together and have hospital visitation rights. Because Tokyo is so vast, this means that over half of the country could benefit from this reform. 
Activists have lobbied on this issue for years, and it would not have been possible without their tireless efforts. Next in their sights is same-sex marriage, which the conservative government has said would require prudent consideration, whatever that means. Solidarity with everyone fighting for LGBTQ rights in Japan. The Australian state of Victoria has passed laws which ban religious schools from firing or refusing to hire staff based on their gender identity or sexual orientation. In addition, government-funded religious bodies will be prohibited from refusing services to LGBTQ people. However, Victoria's law could be overridden if the federal government's religious discrimination bill becomes law. This has set the stage for a legal showdown with Scott Morrison's reactionary government, but Victorian Attorney General Jacqueline Symes has vowed to defend her state's laws, which will likely mean her launching a high court challenge. PLM will be watching as this story develops. The New Zealand Parliament has unanimously passed a bill allowing people to change their birth certificates to reflect their gender identity and chosen name. Now, inhabitants of Aotearoa are able to change their gender and name through a simplified, self-selecting administrative process and are not required to provide evidence of medical treatment. Green MP Dr. Elizabeth Karakere said on the House floor, it is with great pleasure that after generations of systemic discrimination, decades of community activism, and many years of work in this House that we are passing this amendment. Canada has finally banned conversion therapy, a thoroughly discredited and deeply harmful practice aimed at changing the sexual orientation or gender identity of LGBTQ people. The legislation makes it illegal to provide, promote, or profit from the practice and will take effect in the new year. Conversion has long been known to cause lifelong harm for its victims and has been linked to suicides. While politicians are patting themselves on the back, know that this is the result of many years of awareness raising by LGBTQ activists who shared their personal stories of being subjected to the cruel practice. The European Court of Justice has ruled that Bulgaria cannot deny issuing birth certificates to babies born of same-sex partnerships. In 2019, the Balkan country refused to issue a birth certificate to Sarah, born in Spain, with two mothers, one from Bulgaria and another from Gibraltar. Without a birth certificate, Sarah did not have EU citizenship and therefore could not leave Spain. Her parents sued the Bulgarian authorities and the EU Court of Justice sided with so-called rainbow families, saying that Sarah has the right to be registered immediately after birth, the right to a name, and the right to acquire a nationality without discrimination on the basis of the sexual orientation of the child's parents. The Smithsonian has announced that the infamous statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee that was removed from Charlottesville, Virginia, will be melted down and turned into public art. The statue was a focal point of the deadly 2017 Unite the Right rally. The defeat of the fascists that day led to the fracturing of their despicable movement, and the organizers of the hate rally are bogged down with lawsuits to this day. The task of turning the statue into public art has been given to the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center, a local Black-led nonprofit, and will be called Swords into Plowshares. Andrea Douglas, the center's executive director, said of the project, Our hope with Swords into Plowshares is to create something that transforms what was once toxic in our public space into something beautiful that can be more reflective of our entire community's social values. We're giving people opportunities to engage with their own narratives and our own histories. This project offers a roadmap for other communities to do the same. The right-wing regime in Honduras, which came to power in a military coup 12 years ago, was just electorally defeated by the Socialist Libre Party, making Xiomara Castro Honduras' first woman president, a double victory for the Honduran working class. With a commanding 14-point lead over the Conservative National Party, Castro has a powerful mandate to carry out Libre's socialism of the 21st century agenda. This includes a referendum on a new constitution, the establishment of diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China, the creation of a UN-backed anti-corruption commission, and advancing women's rights and social programs to fight poverty. She also proposes reforming the security, defense, coalition, and secrecy laws established by the previous government to crack down on popular resistance. The Bolivarian Revolution marches on. Riding the South American socialist wave, we turn to Chile, where 35-year-old socialist and former student leader Gabriel Boric has been elected to be their next president. The victory of the leftist Social Conversions Party was made possible by the enormous popular revolt against rapacious neoliberalism which has ravaged the country's public services, healthcare, and education since Augusto Pinochet came into power via a US-backed military coup in 1973, overthrowing democratically elected socialist leader Salvador Allende. Speaking of Pinochet, Boric's opponent, José Antonio Cast, was not only a supporter of the former dictator, but his own father was a member of the Nazi party. Unbelievable. 
Chile is currently going through a process of constitutional reform to rid the country of neoliberalism, a process that Cass would have put to an end. Boric, on the other hand, said that if Chile was the cradle of neoliberalism, it will also be its grave. We are thrilled that the Chilean people went with socialism over barbarism by a margin of over 10 points, giving the new ruling party a strong mandate to move forward with much needed change. Kshama Sawant, the openly socialist city councillor in Seattle, has defeated yet another attempt by the local ruling class to kick her out of office. A recall attempt bankrolled by the city's corporate interests lost by a razor-thin margin of just over 200 votes. Sawant's victory is credited to the Seattle youth who came out to protect one of the few fighters for their future. In addition to the recall, anti-Sawant forces spent over $1 million on a smear campaign that characterized her as a law-breaking extremist. This is simply because she successfully campaigned to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour and spearheaded attacks on the top 3% of corporations to fund affordable housing. The horror, how extreme. We are thrilled to see the corporate gluttons lose this round. In Vienna, after months of militant activism, the climate minister announced the cancellation of a highway construction project that would have gone through a national park. Young climate activists occupied the construction sites for months and staged several demonstrations, including occupying a busy bridge. Despite the city government, the conservatives, and the far right being in fierce opposition to the activists, and despite the highway having been in planning for 20 years, the activist occupation succeeded. It is wildly encouraging to see young activists in particular stopping at nothing to protect our one and only home. After five consecutive days of protests and roadblocks across Argentina's Chubut province against extractive capital, the provincial governor Mariano Arciani repealed the mining activity zoning law that paved the way for mega mining in the province. The governor called for a plebiscite for citizens to express their opinion on this matter. On December 15th, Chubut's provincial legislature approved the new zoning law, which citizens and environmental groups said was approved without a prior public consultation and which would benefit primarily the Canadian mining company Pan American Silver, which wants to start a multi-million dollar project called Navidad for the extraction of silver in the province's central plateau. Canadian mining companies are notorious around the world for the social and environmental havoc they wreak, and activists were rightfully concerned over environmental wreckage and potential health problems and water crises that often follow mining activities. Following the victory, thousands of people took to the streets of the provincial capital to celebrate. A strong environmental movement has developed over the last decade in Argentina, and Argentinians have blocked a number of such laws in recent years, especially regarding water-intensive mining. Congratulations to this powerful movement. Rio Tinto has put its controversial Western Serbia lithium mine on hold following weeks of protest. Thousands of demonstrators blocked major roads across Serbia and in the capital, Belgrade, protesters swarmed a major highway and bridge linking the city to outlying suburbs. Crowds chanted anti-government slogans and held signs criticizing the mining project. Smaller protests happened across other towns and cities in Serbia. They allowed foreign companies to do whatever they want on our land. They put us on a platter for everyone who can just come and take whatever they want, said Vladislav Svorik, a 56-year-old economist. Serbian tennis player Novak Djokovic shared a photograph of the protest on Instagram and commented that clean air, water, and food are keys to health. Without that, every word about health is obsolete. Critics have accused President Aleksandr Vucic's government of setting the stage for illegal land appropriations and ignoring environmental concerns, and also of sending out quote-unquote hooligans to act as counter-protesters and incite violence to quell dissent. Officials themselves have also reportedly attacked people. But the activists have been victorious in forcing a stay on the project, which is fantastic to see. Of course, lithium is an important metal for renewable energy transitions, but renewable energy can't come at the cost of more sacrifice zones or be the cause of more rounds of neocolonial and imperial plunder, especially when historical emitters in the West still vastly overconsume energy and resources, harming the planet at large and people everywhere. Solidarity with everyone in Serbia fighting for environmental justice. Scotland has put an end to coal power by demolishing the huge chimney at its last remaining coal plant at Longanet in Fife. This chimney represented Scotland's largest freestanding structure, and for Nicola Sturgeon, Scotland's first minister, demolition stood as a symbolic reminder that we have ended coal-fired power generation in Scotland. Instead of coal power, Sturgeon has claimed that Scotland will aim to produce half of its overall energy consumption from renewable sources by 2030. 
The Constitutional Court of Ecuador outlawed any activity that threatens the rights of nature in the ecosystem of Los Cedros protected forest, including all forms of mining. Natalia Green from the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature declared this to be a historic victory in favor of nature, the endangered frogs, the spectacled bears, the spider monkey, the birds, and nature as a whole have won an unprecedented battle. The Budget Committee of the Italian Senate approved an amendment to the budget law that will permanently ban fur farming throughout Italy and will close the country's 10 remaining mink fur farms within six months. The vote follows discussions with the organization Humane Society International Europe, which argued against the industry for animal welfare and public health reasons, as the farms pose risks with respect to zoonotic diseases. Although the decision requires final approval by the parliament, this is expected to go through, making Italy the 16th country in Europe to ban the cruel practice. Spain has put in place a new law that recognizes animals as sentient beings, meaning they will have a different legal standing and they no longer are considered objects in the Spanish Civil Code. Maria Gonzalez Las Abex from Intercids, a legal organization specializing in animal protection, stated it's a step forward and it says that in separations and divorces, the arrangement that will be applied to the animals will take into account not only the interests of the humans, but also of the animal. We hope to see all our sentient relations one day liberated from systemic oppression. Comrades, if you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to TotalLiberationPodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Halcyon for the positive news background. Thank you to Catherine, Ash, and Jacob for script writing help. And thank you to James for editing this video as Tristan goes on a short leave for a very positive reason that we will talk about next month. Thank you also to our incredible patrons who make this show possible. To become a sustaining member, please go to patreon.com slash positive leftist news or give us a one-time tip or donation via PayPal. The link is in the description box below.